Hi, good afternoon everyone. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining the Home Treatment Team Accreditation Scheme webinar. This is a live session. We already had previous three sessions and this session we would be recapping and reflecting by way of panel discussions about how how the measures we put in place are working so far. We will also be speaking about the challenges we are facing and any learning we are able to derive at the moment. Um, I have got together me, with me the HTAS team and three other speakers. One of them is a clinical lead working in Essex CRHT, Georgina Mills. I have also Kerry Turner, who is the chair of the accreditation committee uh, at the HTAS. She would be speaking about experiences, her experiences of working in triple one services and how the services are responding to the coronavirus pandemic. It's, uh, it's an event which would be recorded. You have the opportunity to type any question and answer sessions in the box. To start uh, in usual circumstances in most places, CRHTs are busy teams with pressure on the services. We know that there have been challenging times in light of the pandemic with the crisis and home treatment services. Since the pandemic, we have considered the challenges faced by our services and responded in a manner where we first and foremost considered keeping our patients and staff safe from any potential infections and also continuing the del delivery of our services, keeping at heart patients care. We found that there has been departure from our usual way of working in such in areas such as service delivery and responding to the referrals which were coming to the services. Our way we carry out assessments, we gatekeep, we facilitate early discharge and we work with our other mental health and primary care services. Our team working was affected, has been affected. Our home treatment, the quality of home treatment and its structure has been affected. And so there has been there has been reductions in the staffing due to people being suffering from coronavirus or self-isolating themselves. Therefore, there has been an overall impact on the acute mental health pathway in addition to the functions undertaken by CRHT services. Um, I'd like to start with first reflecting on how the measures we put with regards to our team working and the staff uh, and the practices which we carry out on the ground and would pass on to Georgina at the moment to speak about her reflections, challenges and any learning on this area. And then we would be able to discuss further any questions as we proceed. So did you, is it over to me? Hello? Hi, oh, yeah, so um, I'm Georgina, I'm the clinical lead for um, the crisis and home treatment team in Southwest Essex. So yeah, as Pramvi said, I'm just gonna speak a little bit about reflecting on the responses that we, um, that we have uh, made to our practices um, during um, the coronavirus outbreak and what different challenges that we've had and what sort of aspects of learning um, and what the staff experiences have been. Um, so with um, the team or my service in the Southwest Essex, we've pretty much as much as we can been trying to continue with um, business as usual, um, but with a few sort of obvious um, changes to practice. 
um, and sort of in things to ensure that staff are safe at all times. So the main, obviously, as is in any area, the main change that we've uh, made is in relation um, to our PPE equipment that we're wearing for all of um, our home visits that we're conducting in the community um, and ensuring that we are screening for um, or asking sort of screening questions to patients before we conduct any visits um, and then with staff with um, uniforms and scrubs that they're wearing as a means of infection control. Um, today we haven't had any um, sort of incidents of having to um, provide home treatment for patients which have been confirmed um, with COVID in the community but we've had quite a few cases where patients have had suspected symptoms and we've sort of had to um, manage the risks and work around that whilst ensuring that they get the help and the support that they need. Um, so that we've managed by sort of limiting face to face contact where, where necessary, um, wearing um, wearing um, PPE equipment and by um, and by using um, uh, sort of video calling software when um, when necessary as well. Um, we as our service, as our, as from discussions with a lot of other home treatment teams around the country, we've noticed that there initially was a reduction in the amount of referrals through to us. Um, however, we have gradually noticed that that has sort of creeped back up, um, and over the past few weeks, it's it's sort of creeped back up to sort of normal levels. Um, we noticed that maybe a lot of patients that would have seen support from their GP and then would have facilitated a referral through to us. That hasn't necessarily happened. Um, but now as the GP surgeries are opening back up and the GPs are um, sort of seeing a lot more patients, um, they are being referred through to us um, and we're getting those referrals coming through. Um, also, a lot of um, patients that come into us we're getting quite unwell patients who have got sort of a lot of psychotic disorders who are sort of very become very unwell um, and sort of a lot of manic patients and potentially this might be due to um, other services in the community that normally support patients um, such as different um, charities or different um, third party services that aren't there so their sort of support systems aren't there to, to manage them. Um, we've also had um, sort of trying to focus on a few of the positives that's come out of this. So the use of the video calling services is something that um, as a team we found extremely helpful and extremely um, user friendly as well. Not not just the staff have found that, but the patients have really found that helpful. And, you know, even when given the option of a face to face visit um, or a video call, so quite often the patients will prefer the video calling um, option, especially at the moment. Um, so We've also found that staff have been extremely flexible and supportive of each other um, and not just within our team, but also in um, relations to working with other services. Um, so we um, obviously as a home treatment team, we work a lot with other community services and um, we found that the normal ways of working haven't always um, been able to be facilitated at this time, such as lots of joint reviews in the community. So. We've been flexible and the other community teams have also been flexible and sort of ways of working around that. Um, yeah, so that's kind of a bit of a, a summary of sort of where we are to point. Um, so we do hope that moving forward in the longer term that the video um, calling is something that we can integrate to sort of normal um, sort of uh, treatment under home treatment team so that it's something that we can sort of build into our practice and then that's something we're thinking about on a more longer term sort of how we do that as opposed to kind of this situation where we've kind of been forced into using it due to the the restrictions so that's something that we can have a bit more of a thought about and um, that's kind of everything for now but I'm happy to answer any other questions um, I know we have also been using the um, Microsoft Teams, so that has been potential that has been working well. Uh, people who are staff who are shielding are able to join us in the morning for the handovers and MDT meetings. So the use of Microsoft Teams has been beneficial. We have also, I think, we have also able to continue to do the MDT meetings by the way of maintaining social distancing 
as far as possible. Um, and it is to our you know, we, we have a large MTT room, so that helps things easier. Um, the second, the, 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 we also had a webinar, you would re recall, um, the second webinar was in response to the National Mental Health Medical Director's um, direction to the NHS about establishing triple one services in those areas where it didn't exist. And this was to support the people uh, who are experiencing a mental health crisis and also to support people who are actually getting in distress or developing a period of mental health condition due to the coronavirus impact. Uh, I have with myself Kerry Turner from the uh, triple one service. She is the clinical lead. She has also uh, been a mental health. She's also a mental health commissioner who was on the secondment and she also chairs the accreditation committee. Kerry, would you please uh, mind? Would, would you please speak about the experiences of how triple one services have been responding? There we go. Got me. Sorry, <laughs> technical problems. Um, so the 111 service in our area um, launched on the 1st of April, um, which was already um, a pre-planned launch date pre-COVID. Um, there's been a lot of work to build that up um, before all of this um, and actually it launching now is quite timely, um, but it has caused obviously other difficulties that we didn't foresee pre-launch um, and pre-COVID. Um, so it's a 24 7 111 service where clients will press option two for mental health support in the area um, which covers mid and south um, Essex. Um, it's 24 7 and it's it's manned by clinical staff so clients will go through to a contact center they'll give some demographic details and a brief summary of why they're calling and then they go through to clinicians. Um, the whole model we've tried to embed um, a kind of say yes first ethos rather than trying to um, question to the client whether or not they should be coming through um, and try and take away some of those barriers that people presenting in self-defined crisis have faced before. Um, in, in doing that, it's opened a variety of um, different presentations. So it could be somebody who is struggling to get out to get their shopping compared to somebody who's perhaps psychotic compared to a family member who's dealing with someone who's perhaps manic. Um, so the presentations vary a lot. Um, one of the challenges specific to COVID that I think we've faced is the um, impact on people with complex trauma and their traditional um, go to such as A&E or perhaps duty workers and not being able to be as responsive or the clients have got enough of an insight to know that they can't present to A&E or they shouldn't. Um, so then I think we're getting kind of a pattern of, of being a service or as an alternative to that for people who are just highly distressed, highly emotional. Um, there's been some challenges as well in terms of the service. Um, I suppose not perhaps being fully um, understood by other organisations. <coughs> so um, we're getting lots of phone calls from paramedics wanting us to attend there and then for people who are perhaps intoxicated, people who have taken overdoses, people who are not consenting to um, support. So it's just reinforcing that we are a service to be um, giving advice, information, but there are constraints to what we can do in terms of consent, um, legal rights, and also for people that are under the influence. Um, there is also, I think, just to stick to some of the challenges, some 
upskilling of staff needed and the staff within the team have come from a really wide range of backgrounds which has been beneficial but it's also um, caused some issues because um, you're kind of set in a way of working um, so some services, for example, will send clients in crisis to A&E, um, whereas a home treatment team would do that as would do an assessment as an alternative. So it's quite a lot about um, upskilling the staff in the service to think differently about what the crisis pathway needs to be. Um, some of the positives is that we have got a star, a rich staff from different backgrounds. So we've got staff from drug and alcohol, from criminal justice services, from home treatment, from inpatient, from community, from a &E liaison. So we've got a real rich um, group of, of staff. Um, with COVID, we had an advantage of having different um, members of staff redeployed into the team. So we've actually had a couple of commissioners. We've had a couple of people from the quality teams in the commissioning services. We've had some quite senior um, EPUT uh, management staff coming in to do shifts, which has really helped just to kind of show their clinical skills, but also it will bring that um, validity to some of the processes and the governance that comes with, with managing these services. Um, Again, as Georgina mentioned earlier, the management of um, video calling has really helped covering such a big demographic area um, and some of the crisis presentations, you are kind of on the fence as to whether or not you need to go out and see that person now. And the fact you can do it via video um, in terms of time and resource is really beneficial and then you can escalate from there. Um, and the other positive is that at the same time we launched three crisis sanctuaries within the community. So non medical models, but looking at actually that kind of um, evidence based de-escalation of crisis without needing a clinician. It doesn't necessarily need a medical model. So just someone to talk to um, a bit of follow up the next day um, and just that, that emotional support that we don't necessarily in the clinical model have time to provide. So the two are really working really closely together. Um, so, yeah, that's just some of the pros and cons, I suppose, at the moment of the service. Thank you, Kerry. Can I also ask about, um, you know, with the within the pandemic, how, um, what do you feel? How much, how much are we able to do face-to-face -face contact? How does that restrict our ability? And, uh, you know, how, what kind of methods have, have been more successful? You would say, is it video conferencing, or you would you you would say that? A telephone consultation is also as good as video consultation consultations. Um, I think from the variety of, me of means that we have got, um, I think it's it's dependent on the situation. Um, there's been there's been a particular case that I I was dealing with for for most of a shift last week and. Um, I used telephone um, and then I hit a barrier because I couldn't refer on because the service that I was referring on to needed a face to face. Um, and yet thinking about the client experience, the COVID concerns as well, it, that was a bit of a struggle. Um, but then through doing the face to face, more information was gained. Um, but then it's the it's the it's managing the anxieties of the staff that are going to do the face to face of the client that's going to do the face to face. The particular person I was seeing didn't want their family members to be aware of them speaking with me. Um, so obviously there isn't other means that we could use necessarily. We might meet somebody in a different area and we couldn't do that. So we're having to be more creative. Um, I think there's pros and cons, but it does depend on that client. I think some clients you can get a lot from being on the phone. Some you can, especially from a home treatment model, I mean, traditionally you would be looking at things like their home environment as well as just, you know, body language, um, all of that other messages that you see and what we're taught is, as mental health professionals of how to assess mental state goes beyond just what someone's voice or, or their phone saying. In some circumstances, you get so much more from, you know, having a look in their fridge, for example. So. I think there's pros and cons, but you have to assess it on case by case. But I think there's a lot more coming out of it that you can be more um, 
creative. So perhaps if you're monitoring someone's medication, for example, um, you know, perhaps that's something you could do over the video. Um, if you can be assured that you can see them physically taking it or if you're concerned, you know, that they're not getting dressed. I suppose video, you wouldn't necessarily need to physically be there. I think there's different circumstances that will give you different options. Thank you. Um, okay, moving forward, we also, you know, spoke about the risk management and risk assessments in crisis teams, and uh, this is an area which is at the forefront of managing patients. In um, this is the key component of the service delivery. With the coronavirus pandemic, we thought that because of the number of restrictions it brings to our services, this would be adversely affected. And we then discussed that we needed to make sure that we had a good communication between our services. We had some way of working where we would be able to manage an evidence based practice as far as possible. So in our teams, uh, based on the experience for, for when we transfer patients, when we transfer patients or we work with community services, we have been able to make use of video conferencing and so far it looks that um, it is working OK. It is not an ideal replacement for a face to face consultations, but it, it is um, it is it is much better than not able to make that pass on that key information which we would like to transmit to, to, to when we are making a transfer of risks and care planning. Um, then we we also work with wards. So uh, with the wards uh, we have been using when when the staff is going to the wards, they are using PPE equipment or they are and they are definitely dressed up in scrubs. We have reduced the attendance to these wards uh, on regular basis and would would still manage that communication by the way of either telephonic consultation or video conferencing. Our pathway also has a ward which is which has an assessment function known as assessment unit. Similarly, we would get in ideal circumstances we would gatekeep patients via the assessment unit, but due to the pandemic, similarly we have reduced the attendance to the assessment unit um, instead of every team sending their representative, every crisis team sending their representative, only one representative from both crisis teams would attend and only for those patients where we would consider and um, that the suitability for treating them at home. So these these um, measures have been successful in terms of they are serving the purpose in terms of uh, making those communications key communications going through. Uh, the risk reduces for us if we if we continue to ensure that the communication between the services is is as good as as it can be possible. We continue to adhere to safe practices where we are protecting the staff and patients from the risk of any infection when they are going out. So there is much use of PPE equipment more on routine basis that it was before. We have also continued to make sure that the structure of home treatment uh, remains as as it may be, as it would be in usual circumstances. One of the questions raised I noticed on the uh, chat was how are we managing with uh, the reduced staff? Uh, in our teams, you know, when we used to pick patients up for home treatment, we would see them every day once face to face and make a phone call. Um, there, I, I don't feel that there has been much reduction in that 
way of working at the moment. We have been we had a period where there was a, as Georgina earlier said, there was a drop of uh, patients coming through to us, but that now again has almost, uh, we would say, it's not yet normal circumstances, as in normal circumstances, but it is increasing. So we, we continue to strive towards that practice where there are risks towards the patients. We would step up our response to, to them by doing uh, home visits or making phone, making more contacts with them, having those therapeutic sessions. Um, and when we feel there is a need for admission, then then obviously we would do the needful. So. So the structure of the home treatment is maintained as far as possible. We are spending qualitative time with patients, either it is where, where possible face to face. If it is not possible, it is by a by a remote method such as video conferencing or telephone discussions. We in our in our team, we have been acknowledging the anxieties raised by the pandemic and the current situation and working together as a team by having the MDT discussions and supporting each other. So I think this holistic approach has been more useful in the current situation to manage the risk. We in the last webinar spoke about um, in the second webinar spoke about the medical legal challenges. This would the pandemic brings to us. Um, and I have with me Dr. Kapil Bakshi, who is a deputy medical director in Norfolk in Norfolk uh, Mental Health NHS Trust. He is also a chair of a ethics committee. I would pass him to him to now. Uh, thanks, Pranvi. Uh, I think uh, it's worth noting that uh, a number of teams have successfully adapted to the uh, crisis posed by the coronavirus pandemic. And uh, I just wanted to give you an update on certain changes which are either underway or are likely to be in the near future. So first, there is a big push uh, for digitization of the Mental Health Act. Uh, th this was uh, re recommended by the Independent Mental Health Review anyways, but the coronavirus pandemic and subsequent restrictions which were placed has acted as a sort of catalyst to these changes. I think there are significant barriers which exist in the legislation and the code of practice about digitization, but there is a clear intent and appetite to review those barriers and see what could be the better solutions. During the coronavirus pandemic, there has been temporary suspension of some of the parts of the Mental Health Act uh, and the guidance which was issued by NHS England uh, supports some practical matters such as electronic signatures on the form or uh, sending the forms electronically or acceptance of the form electronically. Uh, so. Uh, I think the key now is to think of how we can um, uh, how we can work through the legislation to enable the um, digital transformation of the entire pathway. There is a series of consultations underway through workshops. Department of Health is leading it to understand the barriers and what could be put in place to have a mental health act conducive to more uh, digital and remote working currently. So I, I, I think you will over the next few weeks and months, we will be getting more information about that. The second thing I wanted to touch was on Georgina's point that we are in all areas after the initial significant reduction of referrals we are seeing uh, not normal, uh, not the normal levels, but they are steadily increasing the levels of referral. Secondly, when the le levels of referral increase, I think it is obvious that the patients who are um, coming through the home treatment crisis teams are some of them are very severely unwell as well. But equally, there is a considerable degree of anxiety, both from patients, carers, and the clinicians as well, about admission to hospital. Uh, there has been uh, quite a lot of media reports about outbreak of coronavirus in hospital or care home settings. So the patients and carers are understandably very apprehensive uh, about 
being admitted to the hospital. So I suppose in this scenario, the um, we are seeing that the home treatment function of the CRHTs is gaining prominence or is likely to gain prominence. We are also seeing that the initially there was a restriction or quite a blanket restriction on Section 17 leaves when the lockdown was first imposed. As the lockdown increases, the restrictions are being eased and there are a lot more um, home, home uh, leaves, leaves before discharge as used to happen before. And crisis team and home treatment team are being asked to support those um, those extended leave outside the home. So that quite poses a challenge for the home treatment function of it. I think there is a need to have a more integrated approach between the home treatment and the community service to understand what our actual offer is. Because currently, uh, by all accounts, most areas um, in the UK seem to be past their peak, but there is a considerable danger that uh, a second phase or a second wave um, is likely to um, needs to be prevented. So these small matters on how can we um, how can we reduce admission to hospitals or how can we deliver care more closely at home where it could be contained. They were very relevant before as well, and there has been a lot of uh, efforts to reduce the length of admission or to have timely discharges. But I think these matters are going to gain prominence and there are local solutions being applied all across. So for example, within our organization, there is a uh, there are discussions are underway on how we can integrate within the admission pathway some period of leave at home uh, to have an assessment. I think physical health have been using this discharge to assess sort of pathways, which essentially means that the patients towards the end of their recovery journeys are being managed at home with better support from the community services and uh, other wraparound services. We are likely to see similar arrangements in mental health happening um, going forward. I don't think that there is a specific model which anyone has in mind, but certainly the consultations have started uh, all across the uh, all across on how we can build up on what we have the learnings of um, of the crisis we uh, of the first phase we had, and how we can have a more restorative function going forward. The other thing I just wanted to briefly touch on was uh, the question you raised before, and I can see from the publications as well. Uh, people have uh, someone has mentioned about the video technology on how it is being applied. I think uh, although in, in in the crisis and with the clear intent to reducing the infection rates, we quickly moved on to video consultations as well. Um, but I think it poses a lot more ethical and practical dilemmas on how to conduct effective video consultations. The questions which has been raised is that we do not know how effective these are in terms of patient outcomes. I would also add that we also do not know how they are effective they are in terms of risk assessment and mental state examinations. Kerry raised Kerry a very valid point that as mental health professionals, we are trained to use our senses. It's not just the conversation with the patient, but what you assess, in, um, what you see around and what you what the uh, transference and the counter transference it generates within you. We use all these to make a judgment about the risk about the patient's condition and to not have that opportunity in terms of uh, whether video or telephonic consultation quite restricts our ability to deliver care. So uh, technology will transform the way all of the teams work. It will certainly enable better delivery of uh, care through in, at home. It will certainly be more cost effective, but I don't think we should be jumping too quickly onto adopting this as the panacea of all else. There is a there is a case, as Kerry was mentioning, of individualized assessments, case by case discussion on what modes we should be using, what tools we should be using at what time. That's all I want to add.
Kapil, is there any updated um, update on any guidance like about uh, the for, for the professionals with regards to let's say you know how, how professionals would continue to make their practice or approach the the situation uh, the challenging situation we are in is is there any update on that as far as you know or how, how people are approaching um, as far as you have learned about it uh, sorry, is there a specific situation which you are asking about the guidelines on? Yeah, any guidelines about? Um, just a minute, sorry, my computer is hanging up. Yeah, guidelines about you know the um, ethical dilemmas which which people could follow, the professionals could follow. I think I would like to reiterate, uh, um, I did it in the second webinar as well, that we are deviating from the processes. We are deviating from the standard operating pr procedures. We are not deviating from good medical practice or good nursing practice. We all have professional values and professional guidelines. Obviously, with when you are making any decisions or we are, when you are assessing any situations, which which is extraordinary, and I think it's very fair to say that COVID pandemic is a very extraordinary situation. A good practice in terms of decision making, seeking information, seeking appropriate advice, seeking peer support advice, which I think is very helpful, and documenting clearly the not just your decisions, but the rationale behind the decisions. Uh, it, it is of importance where you are seeking off in terms of deviating from policy as a team or as a service. I would suggest that information should be sought from ethics committees as well. Most trust uh, as far as I'm aware have uh, clinical or ethical committees. They are they are by different names uh, within the organization, usually chaired by the medical director or uh, like uh, I'm the deputy medical director. I chair one. So those committees in terms of the when when you're making a po policy change in terms of your service or in terms of your team they are quite helpful in reviewing it so our committee consists not just of uh, doctors nurses and all but legal professionals and uh, um, patient representatives as well they can provide you an over uh, overview of the changes in policies and can act as a backup uh, and can act as a reassurance on what you are doing is ethically and clinically sound. So individually, I would uh, to recap individually, I would ask that people follow the good professional um, good practice, whether it is good medical practice or good nursing practice there to thoroughly document their decisions and seek peer re review and approval for them as well. And in terms of the wider policy changes, if you are thinking as a service manager or as a consultant across your team to seek advice from your ethical committees and clinical committees as well. OK, thank you. I now go through the questions which have been published. Georgina, this may be for you. When you use the term complex trauma, are you referring to personality disorder? Oh, I think that was Kerry, that one. I think, I think you're on mute, Kerry. Sorry. Um, so yeah, I am referring to personality disorder as complex trauma. And just going back to um, one of the first questions that was posed was about how um, do your staff feel about such drastic um, reduction in face-to-face -face contact. I think that's something that we've had quite a lot of discussion about in our team and initially it was kind of a reaction to everything that was going on and there was a lot of settling of anxieties amongst staff and um, also settling anxieties amongst patients and, and not wanting people in their home but we have noticed that um, as the times pass that patients are more uh, feeling more comfortable with um, us actually undertaking the face-to-face -face contacts again and the staff are feeling much more comfortable with that. Uh, we have noticed that the use of the video calling software has kind of reduced a little bit and we are um, sort of um, going out and and seeing more patients face to face, obviously, with all the necessary um, sort of precautions put in place with screenings and use of PPE. Um, but I think as um, was discussed um, by a few of the other um, presenters as well, that 
it does leave you with that lack of being able to use all of your senses to fully um, assess the situation and um, I think some of our assessments have been undertaken over video calling and actually we felt no we just don't have a full understanding of what's going on here and then we've needed to escalate that to sort of face to face so yeah it's a it is a something that we are kind of continuing to to adapt to but I think there is no full way of replacing that face to face contact and it is just has been just a, a great tool that we've had during this really difficult time but um yeah both staff in my team um don't feel fully comfortable using it so I'm, I'm glad that we are sort of trying to continue with that face to face contact and um we're feeling sort of a lot less anxious about doing that as well and then there was another question as well um that i was going to answer oops about um in what way have your community support workers adapted to the reduction in face to face contact? Um, so again, we've been sort of utilising use of video calling with our support workers as well and just kind of maybe that um, emotional support that sometimes the patients need. Um, as Kerry said, it's not always kind of about a medical approach to um, things and that um, just actually being there to talk to people, especially um, through the isolation period and a lot of patients have um, isolated on their own or um, have found it really difficult um, being stuck in, in and not having all of those normal support systems in place. So we've been kind of utilising our, uh, our support workers in our team to kind of support patients with maybe some of those more sort of emotional needs. Um, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, OK, thank you. Got another question here. How have services adopt, adapted to the single point of access lines and whether these are. Amped focused or all age. Gary. And um, so. That one of the guidelines that came when the 111 from NHS England was that they had to be all age given the, the crisis, um, given the COVID. Um, now, the initial model, as I mentioned earlier, the 111 service we were launching here um, was going to be for over 18s um, only, non-organic. Um, but one of the things that has been embedded into it is around um, making sure that although we, we don't necessarily specialise in those other areas, that we have clear pathways of how to refer in and how to signpost without having to send the client on their own journey. Um, so that's one of the things that it's been focused on. Um, and the question around it being um, AMP focused, I'm not quite sure um, what that's asking. Um, at the moment in our service, we haven't got an AMP in the team. Um, that's purely just been that recruitment hasn't found one. It's not that we're not looking or that there's not a vacancy there. Um, but just the, the staff that have applied and been appointed are not AMP trained. Um, but we are very lucky to have quite strong relationships and communication streams with our AMPs anyway. So there's been a couple of cases where it's been a bit more of a kind of conversation because of COVID, whereas rather than before you would have done your own robust assessment and gone out and then made a referral for a Mental Health Act assessment, it's been a bit more of a collaboration in terms of prior to the um, referral for a mental health act because I suppose you're looking at that even more least restrictive um so yeah I think that's how we're sort of managing it Kapil you you wanted to come in as well I I think if I have read it uh correctly the uh it was not the amp since it, it is meant to be adult mental health service AMH and I think that's the same similar question I had as well to carry on how you're managing in terms of the all, all age. You, you alluded to it that there are clear pathways beyond on where patients should be seeking help and there. Can you just give a brief overview of how you're ma managing in all age service rather than a, just a purely adult mental health? Um, so in terms of all age, I suppose they are, there is a, an out of hours crisis service in our area that 
suspect. So anyone that hits the child and adolescent would immediately be signposted. We wouldn't necessarily take those calls. They would be straight away diverted into that. Um, from the older age of, of the spectrum, um, the calls are just handled on the presentation. So unless it's clearly something that's an organic or likely organic, that's where we would signpost it on. But in terms of the ages, um, there's no kind of screening for how old somebody is. It's more just that lower end of the children and adolescent, but that is because in this area we do have an out of hours children and adolescent crisis service that we can that we can pass the call on to. So we don't have to refer. We don't we don't do anything with it. That person is just put in the right area straight away. Um, but there's no upper age limit at all on the 111 service. OK, um, the next question I have here is in North Wales, we are exploring if the home treatment team is best placed to sit within a CMHD to strengthen community services in light of CV-19 or if the inpatient unit is better placed for the team. Are there any home treatment services out there out there that are integrated into CMHDs and not based on inpatient units. I think the, the what I mean it's important to understand that home treatment services have uh, have, have a specific role of gatekeeping and uh, providing a qualitative home treatment. Uh, if they were to be integrated in the community services, um, we have, I mean, I'm not aware of any such examples where there has been integration with the community services currently with, within the light of the pandemic. However, there may have been a need to redeploy staff uh, more towards the frontline services as they would be more, as Kapil earlier on said, that there was more focus on um, providing treatment at home rather than inpatient care. So I think uh, the, the my thoughts would be that CRHTs or home treatment teams are actually standalone services, which are frontline services and integration with other services may have uh, May, may may actually have an effect on their ability with regards to how they res respond and may bring out challenges with regards to providing home treatment. I don't uh, I don't know if anyone else would like to kind of respond to that. Kerry. Um, I don't know if it's more to do. I'm not sure if it's more to do with perhaps what was I'm reading that as in services perhaps different models pre-covid i'm wondering if that's referring to perhaps home treatment services that have been previously based in cmhts or previously based within the inpatient and they're being asked to perhaps change because of that um, i know we've visited a couple um, as part of hs that there's been um, kind of hub and spoke models where you have some of the home treatment teams based within the CMHTs um, and we've done an older age review recently that the team was based on a in a ward so their office building was in a ward setting so I wonder if that's referring a bit more to kind of the safety and the PPE of, of teams being based within those settings. Okay thank you. Um, yeah, I don't see any more questions being published. So that leaves me to wrap up today's webinar then. And uh, so we heard today's reflections, today's reflections on how adaptations are working, what are the challenges, what are the successes so far. Obviously, it is early days for us to kind of um, make any conclusions about what works best, but, but, uh, it's it's, uh, it's pleasing to hear that you know the adaptations such as use of PPE, social distancing, multidisciplinary team meetings, why the why the use of Microsoft meetings have a positive impact and enable us to work as a team. We um, we also have been able to think about 
how we work with other services by the use of technology, how we transfer patients and how we respond to people in crisis via the triple one services. In the future, moving forward, um, it would be necessary for us to kind of consider how do we continue to function in the current environment? It would be useful if people would, if the other teams who are making such preparations or have any contributions would like to contribute to the webinars, we would welcome that. Um, and I would like to thank the HTAS team to make this session work and practically happen and all the speakers. And I hope you all stay safe and well. Thank you.